Well, we're glad you're back. And uh, again, if you're live streaming with us, we're glad you're here, uh, wherever you're watching from. And we're doing this uh, Experience Israel Now conference. Uh, you know, the, the concept is pretty simple. Uh, very few people are going to ever uh, get to Israel, uh, one to two percent. Um, as people are, we're, we're going to do some questions and answers. I've already had a uh, a couple of uh, good questions, and, and so while we get started here and make sure everybody's back in the room, everybody's back online, um, one, one of the questions is, is it safe to go to Israel? Is it safe to go to Israel? And the answer is absolutely not. It's not even safe to go to the grocery store. Are you kidding? What are you doing at church? <laughs> now, I hope you were laughing at home the way they were laughing here, but the, the truth is I can't guarantee your safety anywhere, although uh, I, I have taken my wife, uh, my children, uh, my sons-in-law, I have three daughters, and I have three sons-in-law, and I remember taking the first son-in-law number one, and my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, was pregnant with our first grandchild, and here I am taking her husband to a war zone, you know, and she says, Dad, bring him back, <laughs> and I said, I will not only bring him back, I'll bring him back better, and, uh, you know, there's, there's really nothing like um, a trip to the land of the Bible to convince you that the Bible is, is, is real. I mean, the history is real. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I was a journalist before I, I was a pastor. I was a pastor for 27 years. I was in journalism, full-time journalism, for 10 years before that. And I was in sports journalism, sports journalism. So that was back in when we had newspapers. Anybody remember newspapers? <laughs> And now we have the internet and television and all of that, uh, and we're missing that, those quality articles, I think, from, from newspapers. I had, I had like uh, uh, nine, nine people on my full-time staff at the Macon Telegraph. Uh, we had nine part-timers. We had a whole bunch of stringers. Uh, now there's not even a single sports writer on the staff. They, it's all wire copy and that kind of thing. So, um, so I will tell you as a sports uh, expert that Georgia is going to beat Alabama this Saturday. <laughs> I can dream. I can dream. Uh, no, and, and so I, I, was, I was a journalist, and then God called us into to ministry. And, and, uh, and so um, I, I went to Israel for the first time in 1999. I was scared to death, um, but I knew immediately I'd be back many, many times to Israel, and now I think I've been there 20 times, and, and we began, I began working with the Christian Television Network in 2012. Um, I, I, you know, my journalism background, God works in mysterious ways. I don't know if you've, you've come to see that, you know, but here I had a journalism background and for some years wondered why in the world did, did I go into journalism if God wanted me to be a pastor, and it turns out those two fields can, you know, cross over. And, and so I began doing some stories from Israel for the Christian Television Network, and we began collecting video, and that became such an important part of my pastoral ministry at my church in Warner Robins, Georgia, uh, that, that we branched out in 2015 to go into a full-time work of bringing Israel to everyone. Uh, there's not another ministry quite like this one in the country, uh, and so we didn't really know if, if we would be around very long. Uh, but here I am, five years later. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. And while I've taken uh, about 600 people to Israel, uh, about 600 people to Israel, you know, on an airplane, and we've been on a bus and we've hiked around or we've, we've done these things, um, we're getting close to 60,000 people who've seen one of these presentations. And I just praise God for that. And I want to thank you for being a part of it. And again, if you're watching online, uh, thank you for being with us. This coronavirus thing, I'm sick of it. I'm, I'm, that, oh, that, that was another great question. How's Israel doing with the coronavirus? Israel is completely shut down. Completely shut down. No visitors. Nobody's, nobody's coming into the country right now. They've been in about a four-week, maybe even five-week shutdown before it's over with. This was the fall holiday season. They had an, out, they had an outbreak of uh, the virus, and so they just shut everything down. Um, I'm planning on going back as soon as they open up. I'm going to take my wife so that we can see what it's like, and I have a couple of groups planned for next year, uh, but they're delayed a full year. You know, it's, it's been a crazy year. Um, so glad you're here. Uh, I miss church. I miss being with people, and I miss, I miss going to Israel. Um, but here's what we're going to do. So let's see where we're going. We're going to go to the other side today. So this is, uh, this is kind of our, uh, our second session of the morning. We're going to have two sessions a day. 
Uh, remember, tomorrow we're, we're looking at, at the road to the cross, and then we'll look at Jerusalem, at the crucifixion itself. And then Wednesday morning, first session's on Christmas. Second session uh, is going to be at the gates of Hades. Um, we've got lots and lots of books. We'll say more about those uh, as we go along. Lots of resources online. The best resource for you for this conference is experienceisraelnow.com, experienceisraelnow.com backslash Trustville, and you can download a free resource. It's our support guide. It's a little small book, really, uh, that we give our travelers when they're actually in Israel. So let's take the express journey again. We're at Trustville First Baptist Church here in Alabama. Um, this is, if you've made this 24-hour trip, I mean, 24 hours from the time you were comfortable to the time you're comfortable again, isn't it nice to do it in 20 seconds? <laughs> and it's just so nice to use Google Earth technology. And I will say this, I may say it again before this conference is over, but I never get tired of saying it. I could not do what I just did with this first presentation or this presentation. I cannot do it with any other religious book in the world. There are a lot of, there are billions of people in the world who either believe nothing at all about God or they believe radically different things about God or the gods. And they have religious books. Only the Bible has geographic locations time after time after time after time after time. And in Google Earth, something as, as non-biblical as Google Earth, you can zoom down to any location in the Bible. Isn't that crazy? See, as a journalist, the first day of class, Journalism 101, it's all about who, what, when, where, and maybe how. And the where is part of the reason you know the story is true. If you were on vacation in another part of the world and you heard about a tornado that came into Trussville, God forbid, but if you heard it came into Trussville, you'd be looking on the news, you know, on every source you could to see what happened in Trussville. And then if they give you street addresses like at the corner of Lincoln and 124th Street, and you go, there is no Lincoln. I hope there's no Lincoln and 124th in Trussville. But, you know, there's, you would know just from the where being wrong that the story is likely to be wrong. Archaeologists for years have been trying to dig up the truth about these the ancient times, including biblical times, and a lot of scholars automatically assumed that when they found the truth in archaeology that the Bible would be clearly proved wrong. Do you know just the opposite has happened after 200 years of digging in the dirt? All of the places in the Bible that were said to be there are there. And what we're going to do now is, is talk about the other side. So I'd like to, one more time, take you quickly down to uh, that Samaria region. And the other side, what do I mean by the other side? I, you know what I mean by the other side. If I said the other side of the tracks, I grew up on the other side of the tracks, or what about the, the other side of town, the wrong side of town? You know about the wrong side of town. There's probably a wrong side of Trustville, is there? No? How about the wrong side of Birmingham? Yeah. There's a, there's a part of Birmingham that you just don't want to go to, especially after dark, right? That's the way people felt about Samaria. These are not our people. They don't like us. Bad things have happened to some of our people as they've gone into there. And so when people from the Galilee region wanted to go to Jerusalem or in Jerusalem, they wanted to go home, they went around Samaria. And that means they followed the water. They followed the Jordan River Valley. And you can tell by the reaction, for instance, we just covered the woman at the well in Samaria. You can tell by the reaction of the disciples. They had never been to Samaria. They were very young, by the way, teenagers. Only one of them was married that we know of. His name was uh, Simon, Simon Peter, we would call him. He had a mother-in-law who was sick. You remember this? Are you Bible readers? You are? <laughs> Good. Well, in ancient times, the only way you could get a mother-in-law was if you were married. And that's how I know <laughs> that he <laughs> was married. I went to seminary to understand that, so appreciate it, would you? Um, so Samaria is in the middle, and people just didn't walk. Through. They didn't take the straight line very often. It was dangerous. As a, as a matter of fact, if you go there today, and I've been in the West Bank more than a few times, and there is a feeling of unease as we go through there. I have a, a friend who is an Arab Christian, and so he is my ticket. I always go with him, you know, and, and we have to rent a special car with a special tag so we can get in here. And all along the way, you'll see these big red signs. I mean, it's clear. They're huge. And it says in Hebrew, Arabic, and in English, this road leads to Palestinian village, the entrance. 
is, is for, in, for Israeli citizens is dangerous. We're not going to say you can't go in there, but we will tell you we may not be able to rescue you in time. Now, if you're Jewish, if I'm a, an American, this sign doesn't bother me so much. But if you're Jewish and you've got these feelings about people in the West Bank and they have these feelings about you, seriously, it can be dangerous and, and bad things have happened. You know, we've all read the news and only bad news seems to make the news. Well, that's the way they felt about Samaria. And it's the same piece of dirt. It's the same piece of dirt today. Well, we just went to uh, Nablus and this is a Palestinian community. This is right in the heart of the West Bank. Mount Gerizim on the left. Uh, that's the south. Mount Ebal over here. Jacob's Well, Shechem, Sakar. You know, it's all the same place. And so all of this you can find in different parts of your Bible. Um, so what I'd like to show you quickly as we deal with something Jesus did with his disciples is that Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom. Now, this gets really confusing as you read Bible history because the kingdom split. So here's the short end of it. You had three kings who were in charge of the combined nation of Israel. Uh, Saul, but he only had a small Israel because it was just getting started. And then you had David, and he enlarged the kingdom and solidified it from a military standpoint. He hands the baton to his son Solomon, who apparently is a brilliant businessman and a brilliant politician, and he expands the combined kingdom further than maybe it's ever been since then. It's amazing how far it went. And for a brief season, three decades perhaps, Israel is the dominant world power in the Middle East, in that area of southern Europe, uh, the, the western part of Asia, and the northern part of Africa. Israel dominates everything. His son Rehoboam, you know, Solomon goes down as the wisest man who ever lived. Although, better put an asterisk by that. I mean, he had like 900 women in his life. And that's just not bright. Anyway, um, not, I love women, I, I, but I love one woman. You know, I, 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 the two of us have agreed after 41 years now, I don't, we don't want to train anybody else. We're just, just one, you know? And so uh, he had 900. Well, anyway, Rehoboam manages to lose his father's incredible kingdom in a matter of weeks. So if Solomon is the wisest king, maybe Rehoboam is the most foolish kingdom, foolish king, and Jeroboam is the first king in the north. And the only thing Judah has going for it as this civil war sets up is, is it has Jerusalem, and that's the place of worship. And he decides to, to develop two new, brand new places of worship. And of all things, he puts a golden calf at each location. One's in Bethel, and the other one is in Dan. Bethel and Dan. So, here we go. We're going to go from Nablus, and we're going to stay on the West Bank for a minute. We had a chance to visit what is known as Bethel. And there's a, there's a Jewish village right next to this Palestinian village, and the Jewish village is known as Bethel, the, uh, the house of God. But in this Palestinian village, and archaeologists are still trying to figure out what to do with this, we found, we saw, we knew it was there, but I had never seen it. And I was amazed at the size of this pagan altar that is in the general geographic location of Bethel. I'm not going to tell you the golden calf was on this altar or in this place of worship, but, but there were lots of pagan places of worship in that ancient history. Now, Jerusalem is only 15 miles away from where we were filming this particular video on this particular altar. But there was a golden calf somewhere in this neighborhood. Uh, if, if not at this altar, you could have walked, you could have made a hike to where that golden calf was. That location is a little bit lost to us. But, and there's also Dan. So Bethel is only 15 miles from Jerusalem. This would stop people from the north from going all the way to Jerusalem, which is still up. It's quite a climb. And then in Dan, oh my goodness, this is so far away. This is well over 100 miles from Jerusalem, maybe 120 miles. And in Dan, they have found the place of pagan worship where that golden calf was. The archaeologists or the scholars, whoever built this, this metal frame, that's for the altar. That, that wouldn't be where the golden calf was. The golden calf would have been just next to it on a, on a, on a place right here on this uh, 
this large flat platform. And what you're looking at in the distance is Lebanon. If you could turn around this way, you're looking at Syria. You're, you're right at the northernmost tip of biblical Israel. And Jeroboam said, Here, O Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, these are your gods. One way up here, one 15 miles from Jerusalem. We're gonna, you can worship God, but this, these are your two places. And that became you know, something very, very difficult. Now, this, this, pro, this particular presentation is called The Other Side. So I want to remind you that in the map, you've got a, you've got a, no, a no-fly zone here, a no-go zone here in Samaria. They're, they're already good with that. But we just talked about Tel Dan, and so you can't go up there either. That's, that's where uh, Banyas is, uh, known in the New Testament as Caesarea Philippi. Um, you also don't want to go over to Tyre and Sidon. That's, a pa- that's where Jezebel is from. And it's just completely pagan. And you don't want to go to the Decapolis um, because that's all completely pagan. And so these Jewish people living in the Galilee region wanting to go to Jerusalem had to kind of funnel between all of these pagan areas where they would not go. I started out asking you if there was a bad side of town here. And we all agreed there's at least a bad side of Birmingham. Okay? There are some places where you don't go in Birmingham at night, maybe even in the daytime, but definitely not, let's say, after midnight. We just don't go there. And and yet there are people there. And Jesus went through Samaria. Jesus went into the Decapolis. Jesus visited Tyre and Sidon, and he went to Caesarea Philippi, which is about two miles from Dan. And he took his disciples with him every single time. If Jesus came to Trustville First Baptist Church today... He might very well say, okay, here's the sign-up sheet. We're going to do a mission trip uh, for uh, inner city Birmingham. Sign up here. We'll be leaving at, let's, uh, 10 p.m. tonight. Ready? I'm busy. (laughs) You know, I mean, I got all kinds of reasons not to go to the wrong side of 10. And that's the way the disciples felt. And yet Jesus kept taking them to the other side. So here, here, here is... Here's where, where the disciples were from. This is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a lake. And as from, a, from Alabama standards, Georgia standards, American standards, not even a big lake. It's, it's uh, about 13 miles, top to bottom, north to south. And up here at the top, it's about seven miles across at its widest point. At the bottom, this heart is about three miles across. It's a lake. And it's not even a big lake. But around the northern rim, you've got some communities that you should be familiar with. Magdala, like Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala. Tiberius, the Sea of Tiberius, John called it. Um, it's Capernaum, this is where Jesus based his ministry. Chorazin, Bethsaida, unfortunately for their chamber of commerce, they're famous because Jesus said, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. That's why they're famous. But Bethsaida also was a home to uh, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. That's where they grew up before they met Jesus in Capernaum. So that's the Bible Belt of the Galilee. Now what I'd like to do is take you to a location that Jesus may or may not have visited, but I'd like you to see a Jewish community as from that time period as well as I can show it to you. This is Gamla. Now, Gamla is on this, and Gamla means camel, and this looks like a camel, they said. And so Gamla is this steep, steep ridge on all three sides. It was a fortress easily defended, and that's why people settled there. You always went for the high ground. But this is a very Jewish community. The Sea of Galilee is between the valleys, way, way, way in the distance. So this is a very radically Jewish community. They would, they would rather kill somebody than, than deny their Judaism if somebody was going to attack them. We call these people the Zealots. You may have heard of the Zealots. There's even a Simon the Zealot is, as a disciple. Now, this is a synagogue. These, this is the ruins of a first century synagogue. Nothing's ever been built on top of it. So this is as good as we can see. You have to use your imagination to see the walls that were around here. But I can point out some things about this synagogue that will be true in Chorazin, Bethsaida, Magdala, uh, Capernaum, and frankly, and two dozen other communities where archaeologists have dug up the ruins of these Jewish communities uh, around, around this area, this Bible Belt. Now, if, if you look at this, these ruins, you can see the seats that are around the inner part of the synagogue. These would be the chief seats. 
the chief seats. And Jesus talked about, you know, people who sat in the chief seats. There would also be seats around the rim. And if there's a balcony, there would be people up there. Uh, but the more important you were, the, the closer you could get to where the action is. Now, there's, a, there's an indention here. Uh, you can see a little closet. That literally is a closet. They called it the Torah closet, the Torah closet. That's where the scrolls were kept. So nobody had a personal copy of the Scripture. The only way you could have a personal copy of Scripture was to memorize what you heard in a building like this because they put the scrolls back. They let the children, as they, the, this is the, also the educational books for the children, but here's what would happen in a Shabbat service. So Friday night, Shabbat begins as the sun goes down, um, Sabbath, uh, and Saturday morning is also Shabbat, and so they, the whole community gathers here, and, and they probably had a brief morning service every day. People wanted to hear the Scripture because as they would bring, somebody would bring the scrolls out of the Torah closet, they literally would walk around the room to enormous celebration. And people would kiss the Torah scrolls as it went by. Loving Torah, loving God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. You know, and, and, and this is God's Word. And they bring it out. And finally, the person who is in charge of reading Torah that day will stand on this bema seat the way this young man in the purple shirt is standing. He'll stand on the bema, and he'll unroll the scrolls, and he'll read for something. If they've got 30 minutes for this time period, he will read for 20 to 25 minutes. Then if there is a teacher there, and Jesus often was in this position, he would sit in the seat of Moses and expound upon what had been read for maybe five to ten minutes. And we kind of do things the opposite today, do we not? We read a small part of Scripture and then expound on it for, for, for half an hour, um, if you're lucky. So anyway, um, here's the, this is the synagogue, and we don't know that Jesus ever came to this synagogue but it's possible because the Bible simply says he went around the entire region, including this region. We know for sure he was in this region, and he, he would teach in all their synagogues. There is a little tin roof over here covering something that you can't see, and I just thought about it because we're going to see in a minute uh, some more mikvahs, and I, I believe in the next day or two we'll, we'll see some more. Or if you, if you check out our podcast Sunday, I know you will, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a mikvah in there. And, and the, here's the quick point I want to make. Christians did not invent baptism. Jewish people were already practicing ritual immersion by the time Jesus was alive. Here's your proof. John invites people to repent at the Jordan River, and everybody there knew instinctively, I need to get in the water and immerse myself or be immersed. The psalmist had said, who can come before the holy house? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. More important to have a pure heart, but clean hands is important too. But their mikvah is right there uh, in this synagogue. So, back to uh, the, the Bible Belt. You got Chorazin, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Gamla, and Magdala. I was, I was telling somebody that, you know, we were, we were driving past this location. We had driven by it on this road right there so many times for so many years. And my, my tour guide said, hey, did you know they found Magdala? And I said, what? He said, he said yeah, they were building a hotel. And I've, I know the story now. They were going to build a hotel on this property. They got 18 inches down and hit a synagogue. This is Mount Arbel in the background. At the end of the first century, about 70 years after Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised to new life, that mountain had a mudslide, and it completely covered up this community, and people never built over it. So when this hotel was being built, they got 18 inches down, and they hit a synagogue, and it's covered up. I'll show it to you in just a minute. And they, they started doing more archaeological work, and all of this is part of the community where Mary lived. There's a 99.9% .9 chance that Jesus visited this community, but the Bible doesn't say he went to Magdala, so can't tell you for sure. But yes, he went to this community. He went to all the surrounding synagogues, and this was... This was between Tiberias and Capernaum. This is on the way from Nazareth to Capernaum. This is the synagogue. Here are the chief seats that I showed you just a minute ago in, in Gamla. And this, is, this amazing thing is called the Magdala Stone. Now, remember, that was 2015, first time I ever laid eyes on any of this. They've not been doing this work very long. If some of the information I share with you in these 
six sessions that we have together. If some of it is brand new information to you and you wonder why you haven't ever heard it, um, I'll tell you why. Most of the archaeological work that's been done in Israel has been done since 1990. It takes people a while to dig it up. It takes scholars a while to argue over what it is. And finally, somebody finds this and they find that, this tiny little thing that's got enough something written on it. And they put the puzzle together and they figure it out. Then they have to argue about it some more. And then they finally publish it in magazines nobody reads. And so, thankfully, you can go to Israel and and a tour guide will take you to all these locations or you can attend an event like this or read books on this stuff and you can gain a lot of information in a hurry that your parents and grandparents never had a prayer of hearing. What we're seeing right now could not have been seen before, say, 2015, 2014. Do you realize how fortunate we are to see this? And, and Chris Tomlin, you know Chris Tomlin? He's, he's kind of the David of our generation, writing some of the most incredible worship songs ever. When he took a group over last year, before the coronavirus started, he took his first group over. Somehow, somebody let him and his group come back at night, and he sang very acoustically in this room. And he was talking about I saw the YouTube video, somebody just with a phone. He said, I am so excited about singing here. I've sung in stadiums all over the world before all kinds of people. But to think that one of the last people who sang in this room was probably Jesus. We live in a very, very incredible time. And this is comfortable. The Magdala Stone was their bema. Uh, that's where the scripture would be unrolled or it might have been the Moses seat where somebody sat but I got a feeling that nice stone was where they unrolled the scripture archaeologists are arguing about that they love to argue these are mikvahs in private homes in Magdala since they live next to the Sea of Galilee they can dig down and they can the water will come up and they have fresh water there and so if you read Leviticus and you hear about a woman's ceremonial washing once a month or after she's had a baby this is for that purpose but also the men wanted to be clean before they went to worship again who can who can approach the holy hill who he who has clean hands and a pure heart ritual washing very important done a lot um, and the mikvahs you you go in unclean you come out uh, you come out clean. This one is in a home in Jerusalem that they found when they were digging down. They, they hit something. They uncovered a priest's mansion. This is his private mikvah. Um, and it's just an amazing thing. This, here's my tour guide, Boaz Shalgi. You go down on the right side unclean. You sit in the water and you pray, God, clean me on the inside the way this water is cleaning me on the outside. And then you come up clean on the other side and you do not touch anybody going down that side or you have to do the whole process over. And so when Jesus says to his followers, go out and baptize them in the name of the Father, well, people have been doing that for a long time. And in the name of the Son, oh, that's brand new. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, they didn't even understand that. That was going to be a few more weeks before they understood the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is, this is about ritual washing. Now, This whole program, presentation, this particular one is called The Other Side. So now let's get to the heart of the matter. You've been in the Bible Belt. You've seen the places they can't go and been reminded Jesus kept taking his disciples there. We're in Tiberias right now, and this drone is flying toward the other side. But that's, that's probably six miles away to the other side. But you can clearly see the hills of the other side. While the northern side of the Sea of Galilee was the Bible Belt of the Galilee, everything else was off limits. Everything else, you know, was, was no-go zone. So here's Magdala. We'll, we'll, there's Mount Arbel. That's the mudslide that covered all that up. Uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Gamla, and all that, Tiberias. But over here, that, this is not Jewish territory over here. And there's a community called Hippos. We're going to take a look at it. It's also called Susita if you're into, you know, doing the research. You probably are more familiar with Gadara or the region of the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes because there's a crazy man that that comes to an encounter. In fact, can you imagine the day that Jesus says, and this is pagan territory. There's the Decapolis over here. There's 10 cities that Alexander the Great planted 
that he just invited people to be a part of the Greek lifestyle. There's no synagogue over here. Um, you're, not, you're not allowed to eat pork. Man, we're grilling bacon. We're grilling pork over here. You want some pork chops? You know, anything forbidden in the Bible was celebrated in this area. This is a very pagan culture. And the 10 cities that Alexander planted called the Decapolis, by the time Jesus was alive, what, 300 years later? There were 18 of them. It turns out people like the stuff. And they're very attracted to the lifestyle it opened. But Jesus went to Tyre, that's off limits, Sidon, that's off limits, and he went into the region of the Decapolis. I mean, that's kind of crazy that he went into the Decapolis where there are no synagogues. He's a synagogue teacher. No other Jewish synagogue teacher would dare set foot in a city of the Decapolis. And then I like this line. Matthew says it this way. Remember, Matthew's an eyewitness. He's one of these young men who's remembering this encounter. And he said, when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes. If there's a particular area of Birmingham you've always known, and maybe your parents told you, your friends told you, maybe the police reports told you, you're just smart enough to know, yeah, I tell you what, you never go there. It's like Matthew said, and he said, we're going to go there. We got to go to the other side. And so they got in the boat and they followed him. And they're going to go over somewhere on this side. And the first thing that happens is a crazy man who's naked, can't be held by chains, comes screaming at them. You know, he's foaming at the mouth and he's running at them and he can't be controlled. He's demon possessed. And all the disciples are in the boat going, Jesus, we told you not to come over here. We told you. And yet Jesus keeps taking them to the other side. Samaria, Tyre, Sidon, the Decapolis. There are people over here, Jesus seems to be saying. And this message I'm giving you that you're finding such hope in, they need it too. Now this, this hill, Hippus, to them looked like a horse. And so it's also called Susita. But it's just a small Greek city up here. It's got a theater. You can see the ruins of the columns, most of them broken. There's a lot of earthquakes in this area. And these, uh, these stone columns, marble columns, they don't do well in earthquakes. But you can see all of the different lands. This is the main street of Hippos. This is called the Cardo, C-A-R-D-O. If you've ever been to a cardiologist, you understand where the word comes from. It's the straight street, right? Cardiologist is straight street. The Romans and the Greeks always had a straight main street called the Cardo in every town, including they made one in Jerusalem. They just plowed down stuff and they made a Cardo in Jerusalem. But here's the, uh, here's the theater over here. I'll show you a better one in just a minute. And this is the Sea of Galilee in the background. It's a little hard to see. I was disappointed this particular day. The sky was exactly the same color as the water. And so it's hard to see. But but I'll highlight it for you so that you can see that from here, you can see the other side. Now, the other side is Jewish territory. That's where these disciples were comfortable. That's where their parents were comfortable. That's where their grandparents were comfortable. That's where everybody knew, I want to be over there. I don't want to be over here. And yet Jesus took them here. And I think you should be glad Because unless you are the rare exception, most people in a church like this are not Jewish. If it hadn't been for this move, Jesus going to places like this and convincing his followers to go to places like this, I'm not sure we would have ever heard the message. By the way, one day Jesus tells a story. He said there was a man with two sons. One, the younger of the sons, demanded his inheritance early. He took all of that money, insulting his father. I wish you were dad, father. He took all of that money and he squandered it on wild living. Where did he go? To a far country. Now, I'd always envisioned that he needed a passport and a plane ticket or a train ticket or something and a few days to get there. But as it turns out, if he wanted a His brother thought he was going over there wasting his money on prostitutes. And that's, you know, it's just a story Jesus was telling. But I bet there's a reality behind the parable somewhere. His brother assumed he was squandering his money on prostitutes, which tells you what his brother thought about the other side and what he wished he could do. But nevertheless, (laughs) he didn't have to get a plane ticket. If he had money in his pocket, 
All they had to do was hire a boat ride to go about eight miles, or if he wanted to save that money for the prostitute, he could walk around there. He could start this morning. He could be there by evening. The far country, the wrong place, and it's not that far away, is it? Boy, I bet they'd be impressed with the Internet. Because you and I can get to the wrong place in, a, in less than a second. Here's the good news of the, of the parable of the prodigal. As fast as you got to the wrong place, you can come to your senses, turn around, and go back home, and your father's ready to receive you. He'll run to see you. You know, that's, that's why that story is so loved, I think. But this land tells us, I mean, that it's, it's just amazing to me. I want to show you one, a couple of more things. One, here's this guy, Dr. Alexanderman Irmelin. I, I don't know how to say it, so never mind. But in 2015, he found something. And, of course, it's kind of hard to see what it is. So they cleaned it up. This is what it is. This is a mask somebody would put on their face. It's a pan mask, pan, the pan god, half goat, um, half human, and while he goes in kind of happy-go-lucky flute-playing God from Greece and from Greek legends and stuff, actually we get the word panic from the worship of Pan, pandemonium, um, pandemic, pancakes. No, no, that's, sorry. <laughs> that's a good pan word, but pan you know, the worship of Pan was very, very frightening. And it's right across the lake. It fits with the demonic man of the, of the Gadarene region. Well, I told you, I want to show you one more thing. This is, there, there's only one city of the Decapolis on the, on the Israel side of the Jordan River. All the others are in Jordan. And you, if you take a tour of Jordan, you can go see the ruins of those Decapolis cities. But the biggest and best example of it is Beit Shan which is on the Israeli side. And so we'll just kind of come down here and I want to show you something. Now, first of all, you remember when Saul and his sons were killed on Mount Gilboa? Uh, Philistines, actually Saul fell on his own sword. Their bodies were displayed on the walls of Beit Shan. That's going to be on top of this green mound. That's where ancient Beit Shan was. Ancient Beit Shan. But the Beit Shan that Jesus and the disciples would have known is on the path that leads to Jerusalem. So I guarantee you they walked by it. They knew about it. You know, they could smell the bacon. Um, and, and, it's, and it's crazy. Here's the Cardo, straight street, right down the middle. This thing is huge. This city is so big. And there's a modern-day city called Beit Shan. Um, but you can see the ruins all around it. This is so much bigger than Hippos. And it, it also would have been within reach of any teenager who wanted to go there. You can see the, uh, the ruins. And there's a particular place in the ruins where you can see the windows where the prostitutes were on display, the way they are in Amsterdam, like in windows. You can go window shopping and get your prostitute. You can pick out the color of your, you know, the color, or the flavor of your candy, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's this theater. Now, the theater sat probably about 3,000 when, when it was fully completed um, and back in the day, and no Jewish people would ever go to a play in, in a city of the Decapolis that was in one of these theaters. They were too raunchy. And they, they, you know, there's just nothing biblical about any of the plays that the Greeks ran. They also ran completely with male actors, no female actresses, all the males. Some, somebody had to play the part of a female. You know, a lot of these plays had romantic parts. And so there was just a lot of baggage in those plays that Jewish people just were repulsed by. The raunchiness of it, the storyline, the, 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 the support of pagan gods, the ignorance of the real God, and, and then all of these actors who were playing parts of women. Do you know what the actors were called in the Greek world? I know some of you do. What is it? A hypocrite. So imagine the insult when Jesus looks at Pharisees who are so religious and so godly, they won't even talk about the theater. They won't even acknowledge that the theater is there. And he says, Can you, why don't you get a job at Beit Shine? You're a great hypocrite. And it's a little wonder they hated him. So this is the city. And Jesus, 
This is the city of the Decapolis. This is the wrong side. This is the other side. And yet he takes his disciples to the wrong side. But get this, he always makes it very clear there better be a difference between you and the culture that you find in here. And, and he said something one day that is illustrated by this, this last little scene. And this is where I'm going to put a pause button on all of this until we come back tomorrow. If you go about a mile outside of the city, it's a nice little hike. You come down to another set of ruins that's overgrown with weeds. Hardly anybody ever comes back here. But you can see the street that leads down here. This is part of the Cardo. It's exactly the same stones. And then you get this structure. There's some white stone here. And then there's actually four different areas. This is the biggest one big round thing that held up columns it's the base of a big column and then you get the second column and then on the other side you can only see the remains of the other two that match it on the other side there was a great big city gate leading into Beit Shan and this white Jerusalem stone which had been hauled up here about 70 miles that white Jerusalem stone is the threshold to the city And on this gate, the symbolic gate to the city would be the the list of all the accomplishments of the people of Beit Shan. The athletes, the military heroes, the politicians, and it celebrated their gods and it had all kinds of things carved into it. If you've been to Greece, especially Thessaloniki, there's the Egnatia and you can see these giant columns of the city gate of Thessaloniki and you can see what's written on there. I can't read it, you know, but it's, it's ancient Greek. But it's, it's, it's celebrating the glory of Thessaloniki. They had that same thing here, going into Beit Shan, right in the heart of God's country of Israel. The question is whether or not a Jewish person would go through such a gate, therefore somehow acknowledging the gods of Beit Shan. Most people would say, no, of course not. And most Jews probably said, no, of course not. Jesus went in there because there were people there who needed hope. You know, you can, you can have so many negative feelings over prostitutes in a city like this. Jesus had feelings of compassion. And I'm glad he did because I'm one of those he showed compassion to. I've got a story in my background. You've got a story in your background. Aren't you glad you know the truth and that grace has set you free? Isn't it amazing? And don't other people deserve to hear that? So you know what? If he calls you To go to a place that makes you nervous, just remember the story of the disciples. Every time he came out of Samaria or Tyre and Sidon or Caesarea Philippi and Dan or the Decapolis or the Gathering region, the disciples had stories. They never quit telling themselves and other people for the rest of their lives. It turns out that's the most exciting trip I ever took. I was scared to death, but I took that trip and I saw lives changed and now I'm addicted to that. And I just want to keep telling people about Jesus. We have a symbolic city gate in our own country. You've been to St. Louis? You've seen the, the, uh, the arch in St. Louis? It has a name. Do you know what the name is? The Gateway to the West, which is why every time your, your plane flies to, to the West Coast, it goes through the gate, right? No. No, it doesn't. It's just symbolic. And that's what the city gate at Beit Shan was about. And everybody... Listening to Jesus tell stories like this, knew this land, it was their land, as easily as you knew the St. Louis Arch. And so here's the warning Jesus gave you. Yeah, I want you to go in there and be light to the darkness. I want you to be a salt to the world. But don't be influenced by that. You're going to have to stay separate from that. Because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And you're going to find a lot of people headed toward destruction. Small is the gate, narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. You're you're on that narrow way. Great. Get as many people as you can to walk with you through that that small gate and that narrow way, and and we'll we'll change the world together. That sound like a good plan? I mean, let's pray together. God, let's do let's let's pray together. God, thank you for drawing us together this morning. Thank you for the technology that allows us to see images from the land of the Bible. Um, Thank you for the knowledge uh, that we now have because of so many scholars who've lived in recent decades. Um, God, they've given us the privilege of knowing things that our, our fathers, our grandfathers could have never known. It simply wasn't available. And here we have it. 
But God, to, to whom much is given, much is required. So may we not simply be entertained by these pictures. May we not simply store up more knowledge for our own Bible reading. But God, would you open our eyes and invite us again to go to the other side so we can have some of those stories that will forever transform us. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you enjoy Andy this morning? Isn't it great? Thank you, Bob.